So why are we talking about chronic kidney disease at a low carbohydrate conference? I mean, what have, what's that got to do with, with kidneys? Well, what causes chronic kidney disease? The number one cause of chronic kidney disease is diabetes. And the second cause is hypertension. And obesity is also a driver of chronic kidney disease. And everybody here knows we can reverse those conditions quite easily with a low carbohydrate diet. So maybe it's good for kidneys. And the other interesting thing is that patients with chronic kidney disease also develop insulin resistance. It's sort of part of the disease. Uh, and they also develop hypertension and they get dyslipidemia. Those lipids are part of chronic kidney disease. So they get the high triglycerides and the low HDL that again, we know we can fix with a low carb diet. And the commonest cause of death of a patient with chronic kidney disease, you know, it isn't that they end up on dialysis, it's cardiovascular disease. So what would be a great diet for someone with chronic kidney disease? We've got all these things here and we go, wow, you know, a low carb diet, that might be good. But what do we tell our patients with chronic kidney disease? We tell them they should focus on protein. That's the historical dogma because when you eat protein, it increases the filtration in the kidneys. And there's a bit of evidence that maybe restricting protein might help. So the, the big focus is low protein and ask any patient with chronic kidney disease what they can eat and they're going to hold up their palm, they're going to say a palm size of protein per day. That's what they're all focusing on. And I worry that they, they're going to get malnourished because they end up eating rice crackers and breakfast cereal because they're all scared about the protein. But if they end up on dialysis, they, everyone you know, freaks out and you've got to have high protein if you get on dialysis because that's a catabolic state. So it's low, low protein, and then, oh gosh, quick, high protein if you're on dialysis. Now, there's a great article um, published in the journal Kidney360, Protein Restriction for CKD, Time to Move On, written by some nephrologists. They review all the evidence or lack of or potential harm of a low protein diet. So anyone who's interested in that, I refer you to that, that article. So you've got chronic kidney disease, you've got diabetes, you want to go on a low carb diet, but you go to the American Diabetes Association website and they will say not currently recommended for someone with chronic kidney disease. And you can't blame them because there's no evidence. You know, they're guideline based, you've got to have evidence and everyone excludes patients with chronic kidney disease from their studies. So nobody knows, is it safe or isn't it? Um, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of harm and there is some evidence of benefit in early CKD. And we also have to remember that a low carb diet isn't a high protein diet. Um, so let's look at the evidence of benefit in mild CKD. Well, Verda Health, their five year data, they did have 10 patients with CKD3 and six of them uh, improved to CKD2. And Dr. Unwin looked at all of his patients, some of whom had mild uh, CKD, and he noticed that there was an improvement in their renal function. And uh, Professor Nia Mitchell looked at Dr. Westman's data, over 2,000 patients with CKD2 and 3 who'd been on a, on a low-carb diet for uh, over a year, and she saw that renal function either improved or did not get worse. And then there was a, a randomised controlled trial published last year, only very small, only out to three months, um, but they compared a ketogenic diet, 14 patients to a low-protein diet, only 16, out to three months, but there was no difference between the two diets. And interestingly, recently also um, polycystic kidney disease, which is a genetic condition, and these patients always um, end up needing a, a renal transplant. Um, and they had a study in mice, and the mice seemed to do well with ketosis. It actually slowed progression of the disease in the mice model of this disease. And so a whole lot of patients with polycystic kidney disease thought, well, if it's good for the mice, I'm going to give it a go on me too. So they went on the ketogenic diet, these patients with polycystic kidney disease, and they did quite well. And so someone had a look at these patients and published that data recently. So 131 patients with polycystic kidney disease on a ketogenic diet, and it seemed to be safe and beneficial. Okay, so we don't have randomised controlled trials, you know, we don't know what to do. Well, let's look at all the kidney doctors that are using low carb, because I know quite a few who are one of whom is a professor from Victoria and the clinical director of Kidney Health Australia, and she's here at our conference, um, Karen Dwyer. And she, I know she doesn't like sugars and starches. 
um, we've got Dr. Mohan uh, and Dr. Vatikat in Port Macquarie and lots of other doctors. Dr. Fung, we all know. And one of my patients with CKD, she went to Sydney to see her kidney specialist. I was a bit worried, you know, what was the kidney specialist going to say? And she sent me an email. My kidney specialist was thrilled with my results, said she'd been very sceptical about keto diets, but will look at keto diets differently in the future. So perhaps we can change minds of nephrologists because they're going to see people doing well. So this is a really lovely story. It's an anecdote, but it's a lovely story. Um, and this is a picture there of a Benjamin Clark, who's a medical student at the University of New South Wales. And he's helping me enter data into this program called R. Anyway, so Ben was entering it in and he sat in the clinic with me a few times. And then he went home and he put his mum on a ketogenic diet. And that's his mum there. Um, and they're wearing their CGMs. They'd gone out to dinner. And that's his mum with the visual guides from the internet that Ben printed out for her, and because she's actually a renal transplant patient with chronic kidney disease and diabetes on a lot of insulin. So Ben did this himself, and I actually said to Ben, so what does your mum think she should be eating? And he sent me this text. When she got her kidney a year ago, they told her to have you know, a palm-sized piece of protein a day, nothing specific beyond that, and the only advice she's received recently has been to avoid stone fruit and dairy, but unrelated to protein. And look, when you ask CKD patients, what are you eating? They're all in a muddle. It's protein and then all sorts of other weird things. Maybe I can eat lamb, I can't eat beef. And I'm sure if you have an expert renal dietitian, that doesn't happen. But most of my patients do not have that and they're just worrying about protein. And you can see those containers there in that photo. That's what Ben sent to me because he went through his mum's cupboards and cleaned everything out. And I don't know about you, but I can see a lot of refined carbohydrates. There's lots of, you know, jats, biscuits, saladas, white flour. She's worrying about stone fruit, dairy, meat, and what's she eating? And she's a diabetic. So how did she go? Well, Ben sent me a text not long ago. Hey, Penny, I hope you've been well. Just wanted to tell you, Mum just got her most recent bloods. And her EGFR, and you want it to be high, is the highest it's even been since the transplant. It's at 35 now and was sitting in the low 20s before. So low 20s is CKD4, that's severe. And she's popped up into CKD3B, which is moderately severe. So she hasn't got worse, and she was eating bacon and eggs. So now I want to talk to you just about 18 other people in Port Macquarie with chronic kidney disease that I've looked after. So every, every time I see someone with CKD, I enter it into an Excel spreadsheet, and I've been doing that for a while. And I was lucky enough to get a medical student this year help me go through the data and, and analyse it statistically um, with the university helping us. And her project year was called the Is the Very Low Carb Ketogenic Diet Safe for People with Chronic Kidney Disease? And that's Brooke there at a diabetes meeting here in Queen land in August with a poster that we had there. So what did we, we look at? So we looked at all the people that had been to see me who had an EGFR less than 60, that had been at least three months on the diet, but the average time was 54 weeks, not 57. Um, and well, look, we had some severe people in there. So five of them had an EGFR less than 30, and five um, had an EGFR less than 45. So let's see how these people went. So we looked at their creatinine, and if you look on the x-axis, it's plotting time, and um, on the y-axis is creatinine. And we started from before, we plotted what their creatinine was before, and then you can see time naught in the middle, and then what happened after, and we analysed statistically the change in the, the trend lines. And we found strong evidence that the creatinine was, was reducing, which is good, that's what you want. And their actual EGFR, which is a formula to, um, based on creatinine, it actually improved. So 15 of our 18 pa patients actually had an improvement in their EGFR. And the actual stage of CKD improved in 10 of the 18. And, and down the bottom, you can go three patients with stage 4 went to stage 3B. And one of the ladies who was actually stage 4 improved to stage 3A. So she was categorised as severe and it went to mild. And she's been on the diet for two years now, that particular patient. So that was all reassuring. Um, the other thing we looked at is metabolic acidosis. So the kidneys are involved in managing your pH. And people say, oh, you'll go on a ketogenic diet, you'll get acidotic, because that is part of chronic kidney disease, they get acidotic. Um, but we didn't see that as a problem in our patients. So we looked at their bicarbonate, which is the graph on the left, on the right, 
and it stayed the same. And also uremia, some people say, you're going to become uremic. And again, we actually saw a trend to the urea actually lowering. So the kidneys are involved in excreting urea. It's a protein thing that they excrete, um, but it actually went down. So that was good. And I want to mention, I did have one patient who first started on the diet and his bicarbonate did drop a bit and we put him on some sodium bicarbonate and it went back up again. And then we were later able to stop it. But um, the, this guy had been on bicarbonate before, but I'm not saying it doesn't seem to be a big problem in the majority of people. So is there anything good? You know, you go on the diet, okay, the kidneys are okay, but did anything good happen? Well, of course, you can see there the HbA1c um, from, you can see it sort of straight line and then boom, it drops down. That's on the, on the right there. And that's with less medication. So their diabetes got better. And also their weight, their BMI on the other graph, you can see it dropping. So weight better, diabetes better. The kidneys are going to love that. The blood pressure, we didn't st see a statistical drop, but they're all on less medications. And the other great thing, of course, people with chronic kidney disease are on 1,000 drugs. Like, it takes me an hour to enter all their medications. Um, but we, we were able to stop 28 of 72 diabetic and blood pressure medications, um, and eight were reduced. And of the seven patients on insulin, five of them were able to stop it, and the other two were on a lower dose. So, so lovely. Less pills, less injections. That's quality of life. So what do you do? You've got chronic kidney disease. Everyone's going to tell you it's too much protein. Don't go on a, on a ketogenic diet. Well, look, if you're a conservative person, just keep your protein the same and watch the sugars and starches. OK, so that's your problem, the salada biscuit. It's better to eat the risol uh, and, and not the salada biscuit. Just remember, just have to be simple like that and focus on those things. But if you want to do a ketogenic diet, you really need the help of your, your GP or someone who knows about low carb and your kidney doctor. Because the blood, and not only are the diabetes medications important, we all know insulin's important, um, but blood pressure with the people with chronic kidney disease is hugely important. And the diuretics in particular, the blood pressure plummets and kidneys hate low blood pressure. So they need to be measuring their blood pressure at home. You, as a GP, you're monitoring them closely. The minute that blood pressure drops, you've got to stop the diuretics because hypotension is harmful to the kidneys. And you monitor bicarbonate just with a blood test, so that's not hard. What is a problem, though, is a drug called an SGLT2 inhibitor, and everybody loves them. Um, and they mimic a low-carb diet, which is more evidence, perhaps, why low carb is good for kidneys. How does it work? Well, it makes you wee out glucose, and it delays progression of chronic kidney disease. So all the kidney doctors will be loving it and putting everyone on it. Um, it does have some side effects, so you're weeing out glucose, urinary tract infections, thrush, um, people get up at night, the urologists are going to be busy because everyone's going to be incontinent. But, you know, they're, they're, they're a good drug, and if you don't have side effects, that's great. Um, they do have one problem, though, and that's ketoacidosis, uh, which is a potentially fatal but rare complication, often triggered by fasting or dehydration, and the risk is also increased with a low-carbohydrate diet. So I would never use this magic drug with a low-carb diet um, because I'd be worrying about triggering ketoacidosis. So you'd have to choose which one am I going to do. And that's why we're going to ask Professor Karen Dwyer, who I do, is she in the audience? She was on a Zoom meeting. Oh, she isn't here. Um, I was, this is Karen, who is here, but she's on a Zoom meeting. I was going to ask Karen what she does about SGLT2 inhibitors because she loves low carb, but she also loves this class of drug. And I think she's sort of using them both tentatively um, because she thinks people usually aren't on the ketogenic diet and they cheat a bit. So she, she um, uses it. And also, we actually had a Zoom meeting with P Professor Marcus Seyman, who's from um, Vienna, and he is doing research into ketogenic diets and chronic kidney disease. And he, he's doing a trial using SGLT2 inhibitors in chronic kidney disease. Um, and he thinks because patients have very high insulins, they're less likely to get this ketoacidosis. But unfortunately, we don't have Karen, but if she comes back later, then we'll, we'll ask her what she does. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. This is very impromptu, so I'd be very happy to take any questions. But I guess this whole um, discussion around SGL2 inhibitors is a really important one to have. For, 
for someone working in renal disease, the advent of SGL2 inhibitors has really changed um, the, the landscape for, for managing renal disease. So these, these agents are very potent as renoprotective agents, and uh, we, the, the evidence shows that they, there's a, a marked slowing of progression of, of kidney disease, a drop in proteinuria, and therefore the, the flow-on effect for, for people with renal disease is very significant. Uh, if you can delay dialysis, for example, um, you know, the, the morbidity, mortality and quality of life changes dramatically. So I think these are, they're, they're really important agents in the management of, of someone with chronic kidney disease. Initially, they were marketed, um, obviously, in the setting of diabetes-associated kidney disease, but we have um, the, the DAPA-CKD trial, which was in non-diabetes, and about to be released is Empireg, which is also in non-diabetes. And although nobody's told me what Empireg shows, I, I, I have a fair idea that it'll be fairly similar to, to what we see in, in DAPA-CKD. So I, I guess the question is, where, do, where does SGL2 inhibitors fit if you're interested in, in low carb? Uh, and I, I guess from my perspective, there's just a, a couple of things that I think are important to understand. Uh, one is that people with chronic kidney disease have insulin resistance. It occurs very early with, um, in, in renal disease, so a very small drop in EGFR, we're already starting to see insulin resistance. So in general, these people have a lot of insulin uh, hanging around. Um, uh, when I utilise uh, SGL2 inhibitors, so I do use them in, in people with renal disease, but I also advocate for a, um, I, I like Lucy's approach of low carb real food, uh, and I don't tend to um, prescribe or, or, or suggest keto, ketogenic diets, it's more low carb diets. Um, I think that they potentially can be utilised together. I say, I say that because in the DAPA-CKD trial and other, other SGL2 inhibitor trials where there's been renal subgroup analyses, uh, there's been very little, if any, euglycemic um, ketoacidosis reported, so that's, that's important to know. There has been a, an animal study that shows to, to get euglycemic ketoacidosis, there are two, prere two prerequisites, and one is to have insulinopenia, so very low insulin, and the other is dehydration. So when prescribing SGL2 inhibitors, the, the sick day management is absolutely critical. And I think that's critical whether or not you, 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 you do low carb, low carb or not. So if someone's very unwell, uh, they should be stopping SGL2 inhibitors as long, uh, along with other agents on that sick day list. So you know, things like metformin, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, etc. So the, the sick day management, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, if, if you have someone that's interested in, in fasting, well, then it would be very similar as if you're fasting for a colonoscopy. Obviously, those medications need to be, need to be stopped. So I think it can be, they can be utilised together. I think you need to have a really thorough discussion um, about, about bringing those two things together. Um, I think if you do bring them together, the effect is going to be really, really powerful. Um, and that's really um, under investigation currently um, in Austria. So Marcus Shaman's doing quite a lot of work uh, looking at low carb with um, SGL2 inhibitors. So I guess the, the bottom line is, I think, you know, a standard of care and SGL2 inhibitors now are recognised as critical in the management of people with, with kidney disease. We're beholden to at least consider them like we would for, for other agents because we know the, the powerful effect that they can have. Um, whether that effect would be the same if it was purely low carb, we don't have that evidence, so that's, that's where the challenge is. Um, but I think, uh, and, and, and my experience with the individuals I work with, I think most people are, are, are shifting the dial. I talk about shifting the dial on the amount of carbohydrate that they take from a standard um, Australian diet to something that's a lot less. But um, I don't think I really push people into very low carb or, or ketogenesis. And um, I, I, 
I agree there needs to be caution in that in that area there, but for the majority of people, I, I think it's reasonably safe.